Well, it gives me a pleasure to introduce Bob. I just want to tell you just a brief thing. Not only is Bob a great spine surgeon and a great lecturer who can put his experience together with literature, but he also dropped a 300 horsepower engine into a Miata. He's competed in hot air ballooning events, and he rides a bloody recumbent bike a couple hundred miles a week. So Bob's what I want to be when I grow up. And so let's ask him what if adjacent segment disease is a complication. Thanks, Randy. Uh, disclosure hadn't changed. All right. Very important for us to remember what history is, and I think in this situation, the natural history of spondylosis uh, is, is absolutely critical in this, pic uh, this particular discussion when we look at the adjacent segment. It's important to understand that nucleus pulposus, when we're 18 years old, it's got a lot of fluid in it, it's got a lot of those nice proteoglycans that suck that water in, those annular fibers that we know look like an onion and have those 90 degree uh, uh, fiber relationship that allows us to twist and move and to do the things that we want to have uh, are very important. What you have to realize is when that blood supply changes within that, uh, uh, within that disc, that all of a sudden the proteoglycan ratios start kind of changing. Uh, the sulfates uh, uh, replace uh, a lot of those things that really kind of like to suck the water in. Now they become a little bit uh, more brittle. Uh, we start having a little bit of back pain. So when you're about that 20 year old, you've got a beautiful disc that doesn't really have any, uh, any problems associated with it. You don't see those annular rings and then all of a sudden you get into the middle age phase and you start seeing a lot of these fissures and the tears and these folks will come in and uh, tell you that I've been over and had a, uh, a pain in my back uh, and all of a sudden now I've got pain in my leg and they've got a rip in that annulus and you've got uh, stuff irritating the nerve root and a little bit of compression. Then when you get to be my age at this point, you really have one that doesn't work very good at all. There's no symmetry as far as the disc and you wind up and have a hard tissue problem as a response to those, uh, those instability phases. And so now the, the older individual is coming in with neurogenic claudication, kind of the back pain, the stenotic segment with the middle-aged guys going to have radiculopathy. The young guys, they're just going to kind of laugh at you because they don't have any back pain at all. So I think that's the natural history that we really have to look at. And this is what we're seeing, okay? We've got a system that's dysfunctional. It starts coming apart a little bit, develops a little bit of instability that's there. The body doesn't like that, uh, that extra motion. So what's going to happen is we accelerate the stability mechanism. We add down that, uh, that bone. Those, uh, those tissues become a little bit more stiff. Uh, we become less flexible. And basically, we go through this process. This is the natural history that we expect to see. That's why everybody doesn't have to have a spine operation, okay? 80% of you at some, some point in time are going to have back pain, may have a little leg pain, but I can guarantee you 80% of this group right here has not had spine surgery. This is the reason for that. That is the natural history that we have to, uh, to look at. Aging of the spine is going to happen to all of us, okay? These patients that you see, uh, this, is a, this is a nice, stable lady, doesn't have any back pain at all, okay? Just came in and I just happened to have a picture and I said, you know, can I borrow it? Can I, can I, can I get a picture of your back? He goes, what for? I said, I just need a picture of your back. You don't have any pain. No, I don't have any pain at all. Functions quite well. What we're seeing is that sagittal uh, change of alignment. We lose our lordosis and basically we don't change the kyphotic segment in the, spine, in the thoracic area at all. It takes place at the TL junction and below. And so that's why we're seeing these folks who are kind of walking around squatted don't have any pain, they adapt to that. So, who's to blame on this thing? Let's just look at this. We do our discectomy, we're happy. Oh my gosh, there comes that spondylitic train running right down the track. It had taken place, we wind up, we still have a lot of our back pain. Well, we got a little bit more sophisticated. We got a nice new shiny disc arthroplasty that comes into this thing. We didn't, you know, let's see if this is gonna change things. Is that gonna make our segment a lot better? Well, I'm not sure. I'm kind of trying to change the things. I think it's probably gonna be okay. So the next thing I do is I'm kind of running down there. I'm pretty happy. I've got across this track here and oh my gosh, there's that, that spondylitic train has taken my disc arthroplasty right out of play on this thing. So next thing I have to come to, well, I'm going to do a fusion. 
I'm pretty happy with that fusion. Oh my gosh, spondylitic train all the way through my fusion. So who's to blame on this? Is it the, the, uh, the procedure that we do? Is it the process? And I think that's the question that we have to ask. Is it a complication? Well, I don't think so. This patient came in my, my office, uh, had had a previous operation uh, several years before, had a lot of claudication symptoms. You can see we've got nice stenosis uh, that was there. Didn't want to have anything done, comes back two and a half years later, oh my gosh. Was it anything that we did change? No. No changes. Coronal and sagittal plane deformities. Significant stenosis at this point. Now you're going to have to address it. So that's a situation that well, we didn't do anything any different. This was a time, uh, a time process that's, uh, that's, that's taken place. So it does change drastically. This is, back when I was a young guy, I thought we would be able to kind of change this. Art Steffi was one of my mentors and preached sagittal balance all this time. And uh, so I'd uh, been uh, fusing all of my, uh, my, my spondy patients, which is a kyphotic deformity. Uh, and I, what I was noticing is that uh, over a period of time, the disc spaces were collapsing. I was getting retrolisthesis above my area of my fusion. Thinking, yep, art, right. Let's go ahead and look at this. If we can reduce these, sagittally correct those folks into a, a reasonable balance. And I bet I'm going to, uh, I bet I'm going to make this better. And uh, because we were seeing that adjacent segment problems uh, occurring fairly quickly. So we took a group of patients, basically did uh, uh, decompressions posteriorly, did inner body spacers, realigned the process. And uh, one of the plans was, okay, we're going to make this adjacent segment uh, process go completely away. We do know that uh, from our literature that the, the reduction does seem to, to, to improve. We can more sagittally orient those, uh, those patients. Well, this is what we were seeing. We were taking this patient who's had already started having a little bit of retrolisthesis. We're decompressing it, realigning it, finding it, okay, we can get that adjacent segment back into a normal pattern. So again, as Jens was saying, you know, nothing uh, uh, beats uh, uh, when you're looking at follow-up uh, and success uh, more than continued follow-up. And so we started looking at these groups. We followed them, uh, the majority of them, for more than four years. Had a good fusion rate. I mean, we know that in the literature. We had a good patient outcome. But look at what happens. That adjacent segment, even though you get it back sagittally aligned, continues to occur. Uh, so we've not, uh, we've not beat the system, okay? Same thing happens in the cervical area. It's no different than the lumbar. This is one of our lady professional golfers that I took care of. Uh, real happy with uh, getting rid of her radiculopathy. Comes back a year and a half. Adjacent segment, same exact picture, one level lower. Took care of that. And I think Alan Hildebrand has really looked at this. And this is the thing that you tell your patients. I'm going to do this operation for you. I can tell you you're going to have a 25% chance in 10 years that you're going to have to have another operation. That's standard care right now. And I think that's the reason we look at it. Those adjacent segments deteriorate. So let's just see what the evidence is. Have we really been successful with all of these things that we're trying to, uh, to do? Yes, we get rid of their pain, but have we stopped that adjacent segment problems? Now the whole concept of motion sparing technology, and let's just see what we, we really look at when we look at the literature. This particular study looks at the comparison of the motion segment. And this is where time comes into play. If you look at it early on, absolutely, through that motion sparing concept, there is differences. We know that when you fuse a segment, you immediately change the mechanics that go across those adjacent segments. When you look at it long term, the basically the adjacent segment movements tend to kind of become very similar. So no statistical difference in the range of motion of the fusion. Uh, versus the, uh, the, the arthroplasty. Here's another study. No statistical difference in the uh, pain uh, scores, the disability index, and look at the adjacent segment changes again. Basically the same, no statistical difference. And then Rick Sasso just had his paper uh, published, and this is the, uh, the long-term series of the Brian uh, comparing, uh, and this, is a, this truly is a prospective randomized trial. And again, no difference in the adjacent segment degenerative change on this thing. So well, what happens in the lumbar spine? We know cervical spine's got pretty good literature, not really any difference. Lumbar spine, looking at this particular posterior lateral fusion. Uh, in European spine, it was published again this year. Again, no correlation with the adjacent segment decompression or degeneration in the clinical outcomes when you look at the metrics that we're using. And in his, this particular study, again, very similar, 20, 21% 
which is what we expect to see across the board just in the natural process of, uh, of aging. What he did notice was that if you fuse to a, degenerative, uh, to a degenerative adjacent level, you do have an increased chance of that segment falling apart a little bit quicker than normal in this thing. So, next study, Chen study, looking at again, no correlation between this, the, de uh, the, the degeneration and the clinical outcome, did find, voila, age is a risk factor for development of degenerative changes. So let's look back at that original uh, you know, process that we talked about early on. The process of aging seems to be coming into play on this thing. And then this is uh, kind of a very interesting study, and I think this kind of is the nail in the coffin when we look at this, is that there was no significant, basically this study looks at adjacent level versus non-adjacent levels of degenerative changes, okay? So now what we've got is one, one segment that's looking against a, uh, a stabilized, then comparing those levels up above, and what was found is that there's no substantial difference between the rate of degenerative changes within the adjacent segment and those of the non-contiguous seg uh, segments. So the conclusion of this particular study was that uh, adjacent segment degeneration is more of a result of the natural history than of the fusion process. So I think that's what we can conclude when we're looking at this. It doesn't really matter what you put in that disc space or what you do to that spine. There's a genetic predilection of that individual for having a, de uh, a degenerative process that regardless of what you do right now, you're not going to change that. So that spondylitic train is going to continue to go right down the track regardless of whether you do a discectomy, whether you do a fusion, whether you do an arthroplasty. So I do think it's not a complication, but rather a process of, uh, of continued degeneration at this time. Thank you very much. There's a question back there. Yeah, Paul. Um, I, I think you made a really important statement there near the end where you said uh, you just threw out genetic predisposition. I mean, one of the things I say to my patients, I feel like I'm the educator and I have to make sure you know, most importantly, there's nothing dangerous here if we're just talking degenerative disc disease. This isn't going to paralyze you. It's not going to kill you. The reality is we all age. The difference is some of us age gracefully and some of us age not so gracefully. And the only difference is you've got pain with yours and someone else doesn't. Exactly. But interestingly, when, when we were in Chicago, uh, Daryl Brodke showed one of those cases, similar to what you've shown, where perfect three to one fusion, two years later, two, three breaks down, they go up to two, two years later, one, two breaks down, they go up to T10, two years later, break, and the answer was, oh, she's a wearer router, <laughs> you know, it was kind of, and then I have a guy who I fused 10 years ago for two level spondylolytic spondylolisthesis, and 10 years later, his L3-4 disc still looks perfect. Yeah. So I, I really think there is a genetic predisposition, one way or the other, for both breakdown and whether or not the breakdown is going to become symptomatic. And I, I think that'd be great if we could somehow figure that out. Yep. No, I think you're exactly right. You stress that there's a lot of natural history involved in adjacent segment breakdown uh, next to fusion. On the other hand, don't you think there's a lot of things we can do during surgery to change that natural history? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we all, you know, you, you don't beat up the facet joint up above. You minimize the, uh, the soft tissue envelope uh, uh, destruction. Uh, and then the rehabilitation. I think the, the more that we can keep our patients in uh, reasonable condition, uh, i.e. core stabilization, things that are really taking uh, pressure off, uh, you know, the comorbidity states, I think, are, uh, are extremely important on that. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. And sort of in keeping with that, let's move into minimally invasive surgery. If we think there's a lot of things we can do to promote adjacent segment disease, does minimally invasive surgery decrease minimally invasive uh, adjacent segment disease? And we'll ask Mike Lee to address that. Thanks, Randy. So this talk is going to be a little bit outside the scope of adjacent segment disease. We certainly will address adjacent segment disease during this presentation, but overall I'm going to look at uh, complication profile for minimally invasive surgery as compared to open surgery. So what is MIS surgery? Well, MIS surgery means a lot of different things to a lot of different peoples. Um, there are very many variations of what MIS surgery is, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to refer to it as the use of tubular retractors for lumbar decompression and lumbar fusion. And we can see the tubular retractor up here, and through small little stab incisions like this, we can change a picture like that with a grade one spondylolisthesis into a picture like that with a decompressed, instrumented, and arthrodesis segment. 
So for the purpose of this talk uh, presentation, I'm going to focus on lumbar decompression and lumbar fusion. Whenever we look at a new device or a new technique, we always want to consider areas where we can compare it to the gold standard. So whenever anyone talks about minimally invasive anything, the issue of cosmesis always comes up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on cosmesis. What I am going to focus on is safety and the complication profile of MIS surgery as compared to open surgery. Other areas of interest would be clinical outcome scores. Does MIS result in superior clinical outcomes as compared to open surgery? And other areas of uh, comparison would be the cost effectiveness. But for this presentation, we're going to focus on safety and complications. Now, we live in this world of evidence-based medicine, and uh, our medical practice and our policies don't really hinge upon the opinions of one or two great surgeons, no matter how great they are, but rather the evidence accumulated in the literature. So we have to go to literature and see what, see what it says, and we have to look at the evidence with a critical eye. We have to be really critical when we look at the evidence and consider the source. Here's an example of a journal called the SAS Journal, the Spinal Arthroplasty Society Journal. And on the surface, it appears to be a peer-reviewed, unbiased publication. But if you look in the mission statement, the goal of this journal is to promote and disseminate innovations in motion preservation and new spinal surgery technology. So with that kind of a mission statement, this may not necessarily be the most unbiased source of information when considering new spinal surgery technology. Furthermore, you won't find this in PubMed, so that's another criteria that we ought to consider. So safety and complications. Is MIS superior? Well, this is a great study from Spine 2010. Does minimal access tubular assisted spine surgery increase or decrease complications in spinal decompression or fusion? It's done by Daryl Fernie and some noted epidemiologist Joe DeTore and Dan Norville. It's one of those systematic reviews. And I really like the systematic reviews because they're a snapshot in time. They give us a snapshot of what the, what the evidence is at this point in time. Here they looked at 361 studies. They evaluated 361 studies using the evaluated grade criteria. And they found that across the board, MIS surgery had higher rates of dural tear, higher rates of reoperation, higher rates of nerve injury, and higher rates of infection across the board, across all these, all these realms here. Now, in fairness, these differences were not statistically significant, but it is, it is noteworthy that there was a trend toward higher rate of complications across the board with MIS surgery. They also looked at OR time and length of stay, and they found that, uh, these to be all over the map. But they did know that blood loss appeared to be lower with MIS surgery as compared to open surgery. But let's take a critical look at some of the studies. This is a study by Fan Shan Wu, Minimally Invasive Transforaminal Lumbar Interbody Fusion for the Treatment of Degenerative Lumbar Diseases. And if you read the abstract, you'll come away with these take home points lower blood loss, shorter length of stay for minimally invasive surgery. If you read the article, we have to take a critical look at what their blood loss was. So they're looking for the MIS group, the average blood loss is about 400 cc's, for the open group, about 517 cc's. Now you crunch those numbers, yes, you get statistical significance. But as a provider, you want to ask yourself, what is the clinical significance of 117 cc's difference? From, and is that worthwhile to change your practice and change exactly how you're going to do things in surgery? We also have to consider these data and how applicable they are to our own practices. Look at length of stay. The average length of stay in the minimally invasive group, group was 9.3 days, and for the open group was 12.5 days. So one has to wonder, how applicable are these data to our own practices? How often do our single-level T-lifts stay 9.3 days or 12.5 days in the hospital? Here's another study by Park and Ha, comparison of a one-level posterior lumbar interbody fusion performed with minimally invasive approach or a traditional approach. Again, you read the abstract, come away with lower blood loss, shorter length of stay. You read the study itself, you see for the minimally invasive group, they found an average blood loss of 430 cc's for single-level fusion. For the open group, an average blood loss of 740 cc's. Now, if this is consistent with your practice, well, the, these data in this study may have a significant impact on how you may want to change your practice. But if it's not, then you have to wonder about the value of such a study. Here, the, again, the average length of stay for the minimally invasive group was 5.3 days, and for the open group was 10.8 days. And once again, I would urge all of us to consider how these data impact our clinical practice here, here in North America. Now, this study, I believe, is from North America. Clinical and radiographic comparison of mini-open T-lift versus open T-lift in 42 patients with long-term follow-up by Dal Wong and Mumineni. And these data are a little more consistent with what I would expect in North America. Mean length of stay, mini open group is about three days, open group is about five days. And that's consistent with my own personal practice, my own observations, and my interactions with other minimally invasive surgeons. Here they found the blood loss is about 200 cc's in the, in the mini open versus 400 cc's in the open group. So these, these data actually make a little bit more sense to me from a minimally invasive approach. But it's interesting, if you read the discussion section of this manuscript, starting right here, they state in their discussion section, manipulation through tubular dilator retractors can result in higher rates of neurological injuries as well as inadequate decompression, problems with intervertebral cage sizing and placement, insufficient preparation of the fusion bed, 
and misplacement of transpedicular screws are all likely to be more common with minimal access approaches. So even in this study, they acknowledge that there may be a higher complication rate with MIS approaches when compared to the open technique. Now, the role of infused BMP often gets kind of brushed under the, uh, under the carpet. And I'm going to make a statement which is not based on any scientific study or any kind of scientific uh, um, observation other than my own. Is that I would say that the majority of minimally invasive spine surgeons use infused BMP in the majority of their minimally invasive spine fusions. And that's based on my own personal experience and my observations and my interactions with minimally invasive spine surgeons around the country. Conversely, I would say that the majority of open spine surgeons do not use infused BMP in the majority of their open lumbar inner body fusions. So why is it that we as minimally invasive surgeons use more infused BMP? Well, let's think about what it takes to get to fusion. We know that fusion is just the sum of our carpentry or mechanical preparation plus biology, and we get fusion. Now, with an open surgery, we have a certain amount of carpentry. In addition to our interbody preparation and our end plate preparation, we're also decorticating our transverse processes. We're buggering up those facets, decorticating our parts to subcortical bleeding bone, creating an environment where extravasation of those marrow elements can go right in that posterior gutter. Then we add a bone graft in, and we'll know we'll get a good fusion most of the time. With minimally invasive surgery, by definition, the carpentry is less. We're not even looking at the transverse processes. We're barely looking at the facet on the contralateral side. And the carpentry mechanical preparation, by defini definition, is less than MIS surgery. So what do we have to do to get to that finish line, to get to fusion? Well, we still need our graft material, but we boost our biological potential by using infused BMP to get to, 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 get to the fusion. And that's one major difference between open surgery and MIS surgery is the use of uh, biological enhancers. Now, infused BMP, I think, is actually a fairly good product. It's a potent bone former, as we all know. But if you've been keeping up the literature, there have been some discussion regarding uh, risks, uh, potential complications, and safety of infused BMP. I'm not going to comment on this matter. I think Carla's uh, talking about that a little bit later. But that is something to consider when uh, considering minimally invasive spine surgery. So what are some of the downsides of MIS surgery? Why, why would you consider not doing MIS surgery? Well, one is the radiation. There's no doubt that we use exponentially much more radiation with minimally invasive surgery as compared to open surgery. You put your wire in, take an AP picture. Ta OK, let's go check a lateral. OK, let's go put another wire in, take an AP picture, take a lateral picture. Things that you would do in open surgery, when you put your rod in, make sure there's rod above the top screw, make sure there's rod below the bottom screw. You can't do that with, with MIS surgery. You need to take a picture so there's much, much, much more radiation. So there's more exposure to the patient, more radiation exposure to the surgeon, more radiation exposure to the OR staff. And if you don't think radiation exposure in the OR is a big deal, I suggest you would speak to the members of the Scoliosis Research Society, particularly the senior ones with thyroid cancer who attribute their thyroid cancer to intraoperative radiation. What's another downside of MIS surgery? Well, with every minimally invasive spine surgeon I've spoken to, there's, they always acknowledge there's a learning curve. How many cases does it take to do it as safely and with comparable outcomes to open surgery? And everybody gives a different number. And there's some studies in the SAS journal which uh, uh, go to, uh, su suggest numbers. But I've heard 60, I've heard 70, I've heard 80. And in the process of learning this new, new technique and adopting these new techniques, how many patients do we potentially injure and potentially harm to do something differently without a discernible benefit in safety or outcomes, which I haven't addressed today? Now going on to the theme for this block, adjacent segment disease, what is the role of MIS surgery in adjacent segment disease? Does it reduce adja adjacent segment disease or does it increase it? And on the surface, we might say, well, hey, there's less exposure, less surgical insult. MIS is likely to result in less adjacent segment degeneration. Or does it? Now this is one of those studies that's been accepted for publication but not yet in paper print. Facet violation with placement of percutaneous pedicle screws done by Rock Patel, Apache Patel, and Mike Gerling. This is a cadaveric study, and what they did is they placed 48 screws percutaneously in these cadavers using minimally invasive techniques. And then they opened up those cadavers and looked to see exactly what they did to that spine uh, with direct visualization. And what did they find? They found that 58% of the time, that screw violated that facet. So what does that mean? Well, if this is the screw we're putting in for, for this particular patient, and we bugger up this facet, or we violate this facet, it's not a big deal. We're fusing that facet anyways. But if this is the screw, or these are the screws that we're placing in percutaneously, and we violate this facet, well, that is a big deal. That is the adjacent segment disease. And you have to wonder how many times we violate the facet above our fusion construct with minimally invasive techniques. Would this happen with open surgery? With open surgery, we're actually looking at the facet. We can protect that facet. We won't drive that, the, the tulip of that screw into that facet. So would that necessarily happen with open surgery? 
The answer is we don't know. There's just not enough evidence out there to make a meaningful conclusion, but one has to wonder if there's a head start with adjacent segment disease with MIS surgery. So in summary, MIS, the literature at this point states that MIS is not superior to open surgery in regards to safety. Um, there are some issues with MIS surgery that, one, that, that we should address, the concurrent use of infused BMP, uh, radiation exposure, and the learning curve. Thanks.